Do you ever wonder what happened to your friends from high school? I mean, you were so close. You laughed together, you cried together, you shared some of the best years of your lives together. And yet, somehow through life, you just lost touch. Now it's time to relive those moments once again. Introducing the podcast that takes you back in time to the place where it all began. This is Class Reunion. We're bringing you all the gossip, secrets, and scandals from your high school days that you won't want to miss. Join us as we catch up with old classmates and dive into the wildest stories from our high school days. From those legendary parties to the infamous cliques, we're spilling all the tea on who's who and what really went down. So grab a seat, turn your volume up, and get ready for a trip down memory lane. Class Reunion, the podcast that reunites us all. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Class Reunion. I am remote today in Tampa, enjoying the sunshine, so I thought I would record outside. Uh, You can't hear them yet, but there's some kids playing in the schoolyard. It's just uh, beautiful, beautiful noises and sounds. Today I'm doing an episode of Let's Talk About It, and it is about race. So let's talk about race. That's going to be a tough one to encapsulate in one episode. So I'm taking it from my frame of reference in one part of the subject matter. I'll probably flaw in the words I use and you know the way I describe things, and it's not intended to be that way. So I'm not acting like I am an expert on the subject. You'll understand when I share with you why I picked this choice to talk about race. So I was looking at some past history, right? I, the, the fun part about this podcast is that we look back at Gen X and we contrast it with today and how we were raised and how we're raising our kids today or you know, relatives that we know have children. And I started to go down this rabbit hole and I couldn't get out of it because all of a sudden I just was like, oh my gosh, what happened to us? So I was reminiscing about my favorite TV sitcoms back in the 70s and 80s, aside from like the classics of Brady Bunch and the Partridge Family and all of that. And the more I started to go down, I was looking on some Reddit threads and I saw this woman, her name was Denise, who talked about the joy of television in the 70s because it wasn't crafted with a specific audience. It wasn't crafted just for kids, or it wasn't just adult driven. It was just a sitcom. And she had a great way of saying it was an example of our DNA, our societal DNA, meaning whatever we were all going through at that time, these shows were a depiction of it. And then I started to really look historically. So we had a lot of the shows like Leave it to Beaver, Andy Griffin's show, I Love Lucy, which you know we all loved. But all of a the sudden, there became this need for a more all-encompassing, where are we now kind of today genre of sitcoms. And I was amazed thinking back of when it all started. Norman Lear was incredibly impactful, as we know, he's a legend, of bringing a variety of shows to network television. We're talking all in the family. We know Archie Bunker. There was a spinoff with the Jeffersons from that. We had Sanford and Sons, which was the father and son duo in the junkyard, you know, that they they worked together at. We had uh, Good Times with J.J. Walker. We had Room 222 and 227, because those are two different things. Uh, 227 had Jack A as the neighbor. And then there was a drama sitcom, 222, which was based off of a high school and had a mixed cast as well. And Urkel, Family Matters. I started to look at Black sitcoms. And I was like, wow, how was this so universal that you could have all of these shows and everyone remembers Dynamite. We remember Janet Jackson being part of Good Times and she had a very difficult storyline of family abuse by her mother. Like there was some difficult subject matters that were on all of these sitcoms. And here, a lot of us in white suburbia, in Michigan, for example, we all watched it as a family, at least. I mean, I know I talked about these shows with my friends. I know that if I bring these up, you guys will recall. I mean, I we know the theme songs to most of them. That that sound from Sanford and Sons, the beginning of the... I can't do it, but you know, there are some really familiar themes 
and and soundtracks or whatever that we remember. And I was like, how could that be? I looked back at the upheaval of Detroit in 1967. Horrible riots lasted five days, very race-driven, decimated the city on both sides. It was just a terrible, terrible destruction of the city. And it centered around race. And you go from 1967 to not that much later, to 1970, where Norman Lear was putting out these shows that pushed the envelope. And I'm even bringing up the Waltons that may have been like a white family, but also they dealt with race. They dealt with pregnancy. They dealt with war. They dealt with economics. You know, it was, it was an incredibly thought provoking show that I remember watching it. I think it was during COVID and I was like, wow, I forgot how open the dialogue was. Like there was no filter on a lot of these shows. And we sat around together as a family and enjoyed it. And so you go from a time and a period, and it, and it also made me think of like George Floyd that divided the country. We had such a horrific thing happen within my city of Detroit, but also national news. Everybody knows about the riots in Detroit. How did we go from that to embracing sitcoms that had full black casts? I mean, it it was progressive back then and I, nobody bad an eye. Like we all watched good times together. I, I just find that fascinating. So it started to have me think about the subject matters and how the Jeffersons came about. So you've got Archie Bunker, we all know the curmudgeon in the chair, and for all intents and purposes, it was, a, it was a Republican household, and his daughter, Gloria, married a, a, a liberal, meathead, as they call him, and there they are in the same house, arguing about different points of view, but never canceling one another, never unfollowing, blocking, trying to have somebody sway to one side or the other, although both sides really did want that. In the end, it was agreement to disagree. And everyone grew a little bit. I do think there's there was a growth on both sides. Gloria and, and Meathead, I'm only saying that because I forget his name. Michael, I think his name was. And then you had the Jeffersons, George and his wife next door. And that was a black family. And so you saw the evolution and the arc of Archie accepting the neighbors. And then you had this wonderful spinoff of a well-to-do black man. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to use black and African-American interchangeably because it's just, that's how I was raised. I understand politically correct. I'm supposed to, I think, say African-American, but you had them live next door. And that spinoff is a successful laundromat gentleman who goes to the top, top of the Manhattan, right? The deluxe apartment in the sky. We all know that theme song because he's moving on up. And that's an incredible storyline in itself as a spinoff. And then the neighbors come over and the neighbors are mixed. And it was just part of the storyline. So we're talking, you know, back in the 70s, I don't recall growing up with that many interracial couples. It wasn't that it didn't exist. It just wasn't as prevalent as it is now. And think about how progressive this was. It was kind of like a fat older white guy. I mean, no offense, but he, you know, he was an older guy and his wife was black and that was uncommon. I mean, today, what we typically see is the black athlete with the blonde, right? That's, that seems to be the couple, interracial couples. But back then in the seventies, we as Gen X were exposed to a white guy with a black woman in a high rise in Manhattan next to George Jefferson who's a spinoff from Archie Bunker's neighborhood. And that was life. That is things that happened in life. And how cool was that at that time? And people argued and had difference of opinions without no longer speaking to somebody. And we sat in a household, everyone did across America, seeing two sides on one program, just hashing it out just having difference of opinions. And now we've come up, and I'm going to get into that, of how things kind of, you know, you had to go in a lane. Now broadcast journalism is one-sided, and that's it. And I was like, gosh, we really had such an interesting, progressive sitcom era that I don't know 
was appreciated. Now, it wasn't just black and white, rich and poor. It was also that way with white. So if you remember one day at a time, that was with Valerie Bertinelli, which everybody had a crush on. And um, she was a single mom raising two girls. And how progressive was that? Because at that time, I've brought it up many, many times, divorce wasn't all that common either. So Norman Lear is like offering you all sorts of genres because it's America. And that goes back to that comment with that woman who said shows were our DNA. They weren't built for a specific audience. It was for everyone. You had the facts of life, bunch of girls in an orphanage. And Drew Barrymore just had them on her show. show. And I didn't realize how prevalent like that has an impact when I heard her say, you were a reflection of my life. I couldn't watch the Brady Bunch, for example, and she didn't have that nuclear family. So Norman Lear was really, really progressive. And like I said, a lot of these conversations were unfiltered. And I think to the younger generation looking at Gen X, they think we're stuck in the mud on a lot of stuff. And we really weren't. We were not raised that way. And I just was trying to figure out what the heck happened. I was thinking back to MASH. MASH was total classic. It was number one Nielsen rated TV show for finales, finale, TV finale watch. And, you know, Klinger, if you remember him, he was a cross-dresser. Now, of course, he was doing it because he was hoping that the army would send him home. But again, no big deal. Ally McBeal was a cool show a little bit later in, in life for us. But, you know, that was a bunch of lawyers on a, on a floor in the office who shared bathrooms. That was a unisex bathroom environment. And that was part of the, the funny charm of Allie McBeal was you always had to be careful what you're saying because you never knew who was going to come out of the stall, man, woman, whoever. But you couldn't gossip too much about the office because chances are they, they were in there. Again, nobody batted an eye. And everything now is such a trigger. I'm probably triggering people right now. Welcome to class reunion. But I don't mean to. It's just that we had all this exposure, and I don't know that our children and the younger generation, so I'm talking about millennials and Gen Z, knew that about Gen X or know that about Gen X, that that was really our exposure, that we sat around with our families and watched people argue on television, and and that was it. We just went on and, and had open dialogue, and that abortion was talked about back then and race was talked about back then and religion and money, rich and poor. It was all discussed and abuse was discussed. It Nothing was hidden. And I found that fascinating. So here's the rabbit hole I went down. I was like, what happened after the 80s? And so in the 90s, do you remember Les Moon, Moonves? He's he's a big executive. He started CW Broadcast Channel, CW Network, and he's married to Julie Chen. And she was on the talk, and she had to leave the show because of his infidelity and shocker. And she still does Big Brother, I think. But that's who I'm talking about. Les Moonves, Moonves is, is her husband. And he starts the CW Network. And this is where I think things went off track and as Gen X, we maybe fell asleep. So he develops this network, and I did my research on this, so I'm not quoting this off the top of my head. You can go back and look at how the CW network was formed. He chose white teenage girls to have angst as their sitcom theme, and then he took the African-American sitcoms that were developed, like Moesha and Sister, Sister, and some of these other ones, and put them in a totally different time slot, had them run back to back. So it was almost like a mini version of BET at the time, and didn't publicize and market them the same way he did with the prime TV spots for these white shows. And I'm seeing this now trend as I look back of this was the first of its kind where more lanes were developed. And you'll get where I'm going with my, my theme here. It was, it was two, four, and seven. And we joke about the national anthem coming on at 11 o'clock. Like that's when you knew, or midnight maybe, that's when you knew TV was over. You had two, four, and seven. Nine was, you know, cool because you could get Canada. Pretty much that was it. 
And now you've got this. And then MTV started to come out, which we thought was very, very cool, which it was. But Gen X is now welcoming new ways to view TV. And now the CW network comes on and more channels are developing. And so he does this segmentation and it backfired. And what I thought was interesting is he has a quote where he said, the CW network with this channel devoted just to an African-American audience failed because he said it didn't have support of the white viewer and sponsorships. Okay. So wait a minute, Les, dear Les, we were watching these programs back in the day in the seventies and eighties together, both black and white. It wasn't just being supported by a single race. It was being supported by a DNA of society. Going back to that Denise's comment, we all watched it together. Sponsorships were on those shows. It wasn't until you decided to segregate your new network and say, this is the lane for these folks, and this is the lane for this viewership. And that's where those viewers should be. But then you blamed it on white viewership. And you also had a high ratio of loss of writers, they call it POC, person of color, on your network that you developed. That, folks, is when things started to really shift and more lanes were being chosen for us to go down with political messaging and monetary value. And I felt like the greed of network began Obviously, I think when when more sh shows and uh, channels were avail available, so you know, poor Moesha. I mean, people watched it, but it was not even marketed the same way, and it was at a different time slot. Unless you did that, that's how you decided to base that network. What a crock! And then we started to be monitored for everything that we were doing, right? So I uh, remember Nielsen back in the day, I think it went all the way through the 90s, might even been 2000, where data of all of our TV shows was being sent to other networks to show what was available viewership and what the majority of people were watching. Well, by now, the 70s and 80s and all those classic shows are off the air, and now we're looking and we're slicing and dicing based off of more options. And that's not bringing people together. It's dividing them. Then you bring in politics and the political landscape and you get off of local news, which a lot of us have done. And then you get down the old, oh, you watch Fox versus CNN. And we have just had so many lanes on the highway of telling us where we should be with opinions that are driven by network and the government and special interests that it makes us look like we're such a divided country, which we are, but it didn't change. You had George Floyd recently, but we grew up in the riots. We saw the increase in African Americans being sent to jail over crimes that were minor and that influx was due to politics. We had Reagan and Nixon both wanting to see that change for their own political agenda to make it sound like the streets are safe. All of this stuff was deliberate. And I mean, even a song, remember Leroy Brown? Leroy Brown, the baddest man in the whole downtown. Well, I started to listen to those lyrics. And it's about the south side of Chicago, which is the scariest place on earth which is in the song. And they talk about all the jewelry that Leroy liked to wear with his El Dorado car. I mean, he was pimping. We had Chicago. Chicago still has riots. It did in the 70s. None of the storyline was new, but I feel like Gen X slept in the 90s and we didn't see the proactive and intentional splitting of lanes and division. What we listened to, what we watched, and what we read, everything became a lane. And this is where you're supposed to go in just the division. No one was watching together anymore. We were watching in our house individual subject matters based off of 
what was being fed back to us and what we were told. This is probably based on your likes, right? This was all way before Netflix was saying, do you like this or not? Nielsen ratings were helping these networks be created to divide. And then let's talk about Netflix. So Netflix in 2020 bought all of a lot of the African-American sitcoms. And in 2023, Netflix got rid of them and said, we didn't have enough white viewership. Again, no lesson was learned. Those shows were from the CW network. The, the span of people's opportunities to look beyond two, four, and seven were already there. And they went off the air. And so that loyalty to those shows wasn't there. And again, networks, Netflix blamed it off of the white viewership, just like the CW network did. What Netflix should have done is brought back the classics of good times, all in the family, one day at a time, family matters. Those are the shows that unified the country, not divided. Everyone was in the same lane. We were all carpooling together on those shows. We weren't driving separate. We've got a lot of traffic in this country because everybody's driving in their own car, going on different lanes. So I'm going to wrap it up here. But I just feel like it's worthy of discussion. And I felt like I fell asleep. I will take ownership. I fell asleep in the 90s seeing this early segmentation happen. And why? Because Gen X is so used to change. We're so used to adapting that we didn't know we were now following. We were following what was being told to watch, view, and listen to. And we didn't challenge it enough because we were climbing the corporate ladder. We were raising our children. We were just trying to get them to baseball on time with snacks in their pocket. We were engaged in uh, you know, our adulthood at that point. And I don't think we saw it happening. And then now we know, we know the media is not 100% correct. We know that we judge people based off of what stations that they, they watch and listen to. We judge everybody now. We're much more open about discrimination. We act like race never was an issue and it's only happening now. We were not as divided as Gen X and where I think I personally am taking some ownership as I didn't share enough of this with my children or younger kids to say, hey, we have already been through this. We've already been through the unisex bathrooms. We've already been through knowing gay. We've already been through knowing interracial relationships. We've done it and been there, but now you're doing it in a decisive, divisive and mandatory way. You've got to be on this lane with me or that's it. And I think that's where we've gone a little awry. And I feel like Gen X needs to own a little bit of like checking out of the 90s and not seeing what was really happening and why we be, we have become so ornery. We're almost like the boomers that we used to make fun of. We are so divided politically. And I changed to being an independent because I just couldn't handle the noise anymore. I don't want to go down a single lane. I want to enjoy the ride with the people I love and care about and argue about certain subjects in a car ride. Family car rides were never quiet. It was don't touch me, don't go past my side, you know, don't eat my snacks, don't do this. We all had the family arguments in the car, but we were going somewhere to have fun. And so we enjoyed the ride in one car, in one lane. Food for thought. Love to hear what you have to say. Didn't mean to be offensive. Opening the dialogue. Have a great day and thank you for joining Class Reunion. All right, friends. That's it for this episode of Class Reunion Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show, write us a review, and share this podcast with a friend. Until next time.